Welcome everyone to this month's Master Gardener program on growing vegetables in containers. Uh, our speaker today will be Joan uh, Cloutier. Cloutier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, my name is Bob Sturdivant. I am a librarian at the Cupertino Library in the Santa Clara County Library District. Uh, we just want to uh, make you aware that uh, if you go online uh, at the library's website, you can um, find plenty of information, uh, books, magazine articles, um, on uh, helping grow uh, vegetables and uh, container gardening uh, if you want to um, take a search. Um, it's all, you just need a library card and a PIN number. Um, we are uh, will, willing to, you know, uh, help you with any information that you might need. Um, so without any further ado, uh, let me pass you on to Joan and let's get the talk started. Okay, thank you. Yes, so tonight the vet topic is growing vegetables in containers. All right. Okay, we are volunteer, Master Gardeners is a volunteer group from University of California. We have a really good website, which is on the handout, by the way. There is a handout with this presentation. Our website is listed here, the third bullet point. You can get all this information about events and uh, talks and demonstration gardens and all that right on our website and more information too about growing these vegetables. All right. Um, okay, vegetables. Um, in containers, let's see, I gotta move my mouse here. Okay, yes. Um, okay, so today we're gonna try to cover some important information when growing vegetables in containers. We're gonna talk about some of the advantages containers have when you're growing vegetables. Some of the types of containers you might use, some water management issues in containers, soil mix, fertilizing, um, problems to avoid when growing in containers, um, the best vegetables for growing in containers and possible pest problems in containers. Um, now here are some pictures of some warm season vegetables in containers. Um, we call, I'm calling them vegetables for all practice, practical purposes tonight, but actually a lot of warm season vegetables are really fruit, you know, like a tomato and a cucumber and eggplant. It's really a fruit, but you know what? We'll just call them vegetables. All right. Cool season vegetables. Here are some examples. We're going to talk about these tonight too, growing these in containers. And these require a cooler climate or in winter. And we're going to talk about root vegetables and things like leafy greens, salad greens, um, broccoli, and some other things. So if you live in Northern California and especially the Bay Area, you really can grow um, vegetables in containers all year round. So you can have vegetables to eat every month of the year. So we're very lucky. Okay, why grow in a container? Well, there might be a lack of sun in parts of your yard, especially in winter, when those fences might cast big shadows in parts of your yard. So if you grow in a container, maybe you can use it to the sunniest part of your property. Um, or it, you might be a, in a very small yard or a patio only like see some of these pictures here, it's just a deck, here it's just a patio or a balcony somewhere. So anyway, you could still grow in containers, you know, if you have that space. Drainage problems. If your yard looks like this in winter, you're not gonna grow vegetables in the soil very well. Large tree roots. If you have, see this tree on the bottom and it doesn't have to be this big of a tree, but if you have a lot of tree roots in your yard, you know, it's gonna be very difficult to grow vegetables, to dig up a space and grow vegetables, but you could grow in containers um, not too far away from that tree. Okay, um, some other reasons to grow in a container. 
There are some disease pathogens that reside in the soil and they can last a long time in the soil, such as verticillium or fusarium wilt and tomatoes. It's a fungus, look at these tomatoes. Have yours looked like this for a few years in a row? You might have one of these diseases. So you might wanna consider growing in a pot next time, growing your tomatoes in a pot, in a container. Do you have gophers? See this little guy on the bottom? Gophers can really be a big problem and it doesn't take long and they can start chewing through roots. You might say, oh, I don't have enough time today to put a gopher, gopher traps or oh, I don't have time to put all my vegetables in those gopher baskets and plant them that way. Um, they can do a lot of harm very quickly. So you might just say, well, I just think I'm gonna grow in containers instead. And also, Sometimes um, your soil will warm up a lot faster in a container than it will um, in your um, garden soil, in your ground or garden soil outside. So a container can warm up faster and a lot of times you can harvest your vegetables faster that way. Also, cleaner vegetables and easier to pick, especially in winter, you can get cleaner vegetables. I love growing spinach and lettuce and bok choy in containers because it's so easy to pick them and they're really clean when you grow them in containers. In winter, you might have mud and you know splash, soil splash on them and everything. So they're easy to pick. Also, I grow some zucchinis in a container type zucchini and they're so easy to pick instead of having that vine sprawling all over on the ground. Containers can be moved. You can choose a good spot for your container. Um, you know, try to get a sunny area if possible. You know, the sunniest area possible. Um, usually at growing in a container, once you have the vegetable in there, it's less labor intensive and, cl and cleaner, like I said before. Also, you may have less weeds in a container too. If you do have some weeds, pick them out right away, but it's pretty easy to weed a container versus your garden soil. <clears throat> okay. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about types of containers. Lots of different types of containers. Here there are pictures of terracotta on the left. Now, if you're in an area that gets heavy frost, you may get them cracking in winter time. This has happened to me, but, and it also dries out, terracotta um, clay dries out really fast. But, you know, if you live in a lot of parts of the Bay Area where you don't get heavy freezes, clay would be really good to grow in winter and in summer, as long as you water it enough, because they do dry out a lot. Glazed ceramic on the right, they can be very beautiful. They'll retain a lot more moisture because they're glazed than clay will. Okay, you can also grow in wicker, wood, wine barrels, wooden boxes. Um, wood will dry out a lot faster, especially in summer. So you just have to be aware of this and watch the water. So one of the points I wanna make is, if you're growing in different containers, you might have some in wood, some in plastic, some in terracotta or glazed containers, you may have to water them a little bit differently. So we're gonna make a big point tonight of checking the soil moisture, even just with your fingers is, is good because some, some things dry out faster than others. But wood is very good. I grow a lot of things in wine barrels and, and even pallets, this is an old pallet. Now greens, your salad greens would grow very well. And a lot of people are growing um, salad greens in these wooden pallets. So you can get a lot of um, vegetables in a small amount of space that way. Okay, plastic. Plastic will retain moisture. Um, make sure if you're using buckets or old bins, like bins like this, make sure there's holes on the bottom though. And one of the things black plastic if the sun is hitting those black plastic containers and if it's in summer, um, they can get really, really hot. There are some nice plastic pots too, like the one on the bottom. This is not very deep because lettuce does not need a deep container. Okay, a few things about black plastic. Easily can get over 110 degrees in summer if the sun is hitting them, roots may die. But black plastic pots, they're very difficult to recycle. I've been reading a lot about this and they say that a lot of pots that go to the recycling centers may not be, they might not be recycled, don't count on it. They might be thrown in the landfill because there's not much of a demand at this point for black plastic pots. 
Now, maybe this will change in a year or so, but right now it's, it's not a good situation. So I think bottom line, if you can reuse your pots, your black plastic pots, if you have a lot of them and you can reuse them, that would be great. Now you can paint them. This person painted them blue, which is probably okay. They probably won't retain as much heat with the sun hitting them as black. Here they're painting them white. Also there, um, you can be real creative with black plastic pots. You can use plant covers. Like on the right, I got this at a trade show. I guess they were making um, black, I mean, these covers that you can put around black plastic pots. And um, they're made out of old scraps of upholstery fabric for outdoor furniture. So they're UV inhibitor. And I'll say that little sleeve there I have, that's lasted many, many years already. Here's someone used rope around their black plastic containers. Here's somebody used some fancy grow bags they bought and they put the black plastic five gallon containers inside there. So be creative. You can maybe reuse some black plastic pots for right now. Um, grow bags, these are really getting popular, but there's lots of different types of grow bags. So I can't really tell you if they retain a lot of moisture or not. The cloth ones will dry out much faster and the recycled plastic ones also. But then there's polypropylene and a lot of, um, some grow bags are made out of just pure black plastic. Make sure there's holes on the bottom of those and those will retain a lot more water. But um, I grew a bunch of potatoes last year in grow bags that kind of looked like this. I think they were made out of recycled plastic and um, they drain real well and they don't even have holes on the bottom. And my potatoes turned out really good. I lost a whole row of potatoes in my garden bed last year for gophers. One gopher did so much damage in the very little time, in just a few days. So just wanna warn you about that. But the grow bags worked really well. Um, okay, polystyrene or resin. Um, these are nice because they're very lightweight and they really have a lot of insulating ability. And I've had, I've had some of these pots and some of these for over 12 or 14 years already. And I will say they're very easy to repair. This one had a huge crack in it. I used some good glue and it's five years later and I haven't had any problems. I had a chip out of it, I glued it back. And resin too, you can paint these too if they start looking tacky. Um, you can paint them, you can repair them very easy. So um, lightweight is good if you have, start getting back problems. <clears throat> okay, metal, you can use metal. It gets kind of cold in winter, but it seems to work fairly well around here. People aren't really having problems. You know, old uh, wagon, uh, wagons and old wheelbarrows and plastic bins are fine. Also, um, these, not plastic, metal, I'm talking about metal now. The metal um, butter cookie containers, anyway, they work good for lettuce. Just make sure you punch enough holes on the bottom of the container because lettuce is shallow rooted and lettuce grows very well in that. Okay, and there are some other things, you know, these are plastic, large plastic grocery bags. And then you've got pulp pots and they're used out of recyclable or recycled paper and cardboard. Then you have big plastic bags. You have soil mix bags that some people are turning sideways and growing greens or other vegetables in there. Um, a lot of us are accumulating some of the grocery bags. When they did the plastic bag ban, they were um, giving away a lot of grocery bags. You can grow in those too, make sure there's holes in the bottom if they don't drain. That's always important. Other, um, <clears throat> there's plastic. I mean, there's regular dishes that as long as they have holes in the bottom, they'll work. Here, somebody used plastic bottles. It's kind of a cute idea, but I think this would be a lot of work because just think you have to water every one of those plants and you have to have drain holes on the bottom. So it, it's cute, but it might be a lot of work. Somebody did a school garden out of mini bulk bags that they ship commodities in that they didn't use and need anymore. Um, plastic milk cartons, um, you know, you can start some of the green salad greens in there or even grow greens because a lot of them don't require, you know, really deep pots. Okay, people ask, what about saucers? Should I put a saucer under my container? Is there a problem? Standing water in the saucer is what causes problems. So um, if you have a saucer and, it's, and you're letting water accumulate, you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have 
possibly mosquitoes are going to breed in there. And also you're going to get algae growth. What algae growth does, it attracts fungus gnats. And fungus gnats will lay eggs in your soil. They'll hatch and the larvae of fungus gnats can eat new roots. So your plant might not be as healthy if you let it sit in water. Then the root system of the plant too, if you let it sit in water, your roots are gonna be soggy on the bottom of the pot. Therefore, you might get root rot and some fungal diseases and you might lose the plant. Now, some of you might be on patios where you can't leave stains or, some, or you can't leave a lot of water on the patio. So if you use a plastic or if you use a saucer under a pot, you can wait, you know, after you water the plant, wait a few minutes and then dump the water out, you know, dump it out. So you don't have a big pool of water there. And by the way, I do recommend you should, when you water containers, you should have some leaching out of the bottom of your pot. If you never let any water leach out of the bottom of your pot, you might have a salts problem because there are salts in our water in most cases and also you know, fertilizer and in your soil mix. So you always wanna let some water leach out of the bottom of your pots, but just don't set your pot in the leachate water <laughs> for a long period of time. All right, drainage in your container. We're talking a, kind of a lot about drainage. So make sure you have enough holes in the bottom of the container. Commercial nursery pots look kind of like this. They always have lots of holes in because when they're growing um, plants in a commercial nursery, they don't want to risk having root rot or some fungal root diseases. So they want to make darn sure they have good drainage on the bottom of the pot. So drainage, very important. Um, another thing about location of the container. Okay, sunlight. Kind of the general rule is to have at least five, grow your vegetables in winter, your winter cool season vegetables in at least five to six hours of sunlight. Now in summer, your warm season vegetables, they say about eight or more hours. Okay, now if you're gonna get really disappointed because you're on a patio and you don't have five to six hours in winter and you don't have eight hours in summer, I'll give you some things to try. If you really wanna grow some vegetables, in winter, your cool season vegetables that might do okay in less than five or six hours are arugula, um, mustard greens, miner's lettuce, and possibly kale. Those are um, vegetables you might try. If I'm not gonna guarantee results, everything will be much better if you get five to six hours in winter, but you might try you know, see how they do in your location. I, I know in my yard, I'm very successful. Arugula, you can grow almost anywhere in winter and it does, does okay. Arugula and <clears throat> miner's lettuce, no problem, even with mustards and um, kale. But, you know, try it yourself. Okay, in summer, if you don't get eight hours of sunlight and if you really, really had your heart set on growing tomatoes, try cherry tomatoes. Just get a cherry tomato seedling and plant it in a pot and see if it grows because I've been to some other master gardeners houses and they swear that cherry tomatoes do not need eight hours of sunlight but again the standard rule in all the books you're going to see and all the research is going to say they do best eight or more hours but sometimes cherry tomatoes I was at this master gardeners house and he had a couple different pots of cherry tomatoes under his redwood tree and boy they were producing pretty well and he said I mean, geez, I only get five hours here in sunlight, of sunlight during the summer. So it's something you might try. Okay, a container should not stand in water. So notice this person who's growing salad greens in um, <clears throat> potting soil bags sideways, he is putting them on a raised area to make sure they're not sitting in a puddle of water. Okay, and they have holes on the bottom too. Here they have in a container. And also easy access is important. Because in winter, if you have to walk through a bunch of mud to harvest your winter vegetables, you may, may not be harvesting them a lot. It might deter you from doing that. And in summer, you know, water, you might have to water your containers a lot. And if you don't have an access, access to water and you have to walk a long ways, it might be a long walk with a sprinkling can quite frequently. So just think about access. <clears throat> okay. Okay, again, oh, another thing about location of container. Be careful, if your container is sitting on the ground, there could be some invader roots that wanna 
enter that container because not, you have a nice moist area with nutrients and wow. The container on the left is a wine barrel in my yard. And this summer I had a drip system on it. I had a tomato in there. <clears throat> it was drying out so fast. I had a wa hand water in addition to the drip system. I had a hand water every single day and it would hardly stay moist enough. And then when I took the tomato plant out and took the soil out at the end of the year, I discovered um, there were massive roots in there from the tree behind it. So the roots got through the drainage hole and grew into my container. And then I knew why it dried out so fast. So what I did, I put some bricks down and I had some old tiles and then I put the wine barrel on that. So it's not sitting right on the soil. So just be aware of this. If you can turn your container ever so often, that might be a good idea when you take the soil out and put new so soil in too, you'll, you'll find out <laughs> if you have roots coming. And I know this might be a little off, we're not gonna talk about um, raised beds tonight. It's sort of a container, but it's kind of between growing in the soil, in your garden soil and growing in a container. <clears throat> but if you're putting in any new raised beds, we always talk about oh, gopher wire or that hardware wire that you put in so the gophers don't get through there. But weeds, I mean, not weeds, um, roots can easily get into raised beds. And so many people have had this problem. I have a problem with one of my raised beds. I think one of my fruit tree, the roots are getting in there. So you might wanna think about putting weed cloth on the bottom of your raised beds if you're building any new ones. <clears throat> okay, we'll talk about, um, the size and depth of the container. All right, um, broccoli, broccoli and tomatoes. Broccoli, if, it, if the plant is big, you need a big container. Broccoli usually use, you need a pretty big container for broccoli. <clears throat> tomato plants, it depends on which tomato you're growing. Read the label, it depends on the variety. Read the, um, the plant tag or the seed package if you're germinating your own seeds. Some tomatoes are compact now. They have a lot of compact varieties, but like these tomatoes are in big pots here because they're larger sized tomatoes. So large plant, plants, large containers. But a lot of your cool season vegetables, some of them you can grow in really small containers. Just for the fun of it, I grew these radishes and plug trays and they're even smaller than the six pack vegetables you buy in the garden center, those plug trays and radishes grew just fine there. It was no problem. Radishes don't require a real deep soil. Okay, your lettuce greens, spinach, things like that. You don't need a real deep container. Um, bok choy, these are three inch pots of bok choy. Um, bok choy, may, if you wanna grow in full size, maybe a little bit um, deeper container than you would on the salad greens. <clears throat> um, this bok choy, I had so much, I planted in my raised bed and then I had extras. So don't forget, you can harvest greens at any time. So these bok choy, what I did, I thought, oh, I'll just cut them off and use them in the salad tonight because I have plenty of bok choy growing in my raised beds. So anytime when you're growing salad greens, you don't have to let them get mature. You can eat them anytime. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about growth rates at different times of the year. <clears throat> The slowest time of the year is late November, December, and January for vegetables. So if you're going to direct seed directly into your outdoor containers, this time of the year, the seeds are going to germinate really slow. The problem with that is if you have a big rainstorm after you planted them or real cold weather, they're going to sit there. They might wash away. They might, the birds or some critter might get them. They might rot. So you, you're more likely to have a problem if you direct seed during these months. Something like arugula, arugula is so easy to grow, arugula, mustard greens, or miner's lettuce, you probably could direct seed any, you know, they're just so easy to grow. But, you know, lettuce and even spinach, I think I would, I would um, use transplants. Now you say, what is a transplant? Okay, a seedling that's grown, um, big enough that it has some uh, has enough roots and it has several leaves on it, um, like like the things they sell in the garden center, like this six pack of lettuce. These are transplants. And you can transplant them directly into your outdoor pots any time of the year. <clears throat> okay, so February you'll you'll start getting a little more growth. Growth <clears throat> it'll be 
faster at the end of the month. In March and April, <clears throat> you'll get medium and faster growth in March and April. <clears throat> May through September, that's when you can direct seed a lot of warm season crops directly into your um, pots and they should do fine. October is going to be the tail end of your warm season, warm season crops, and you probably could direct seed some of your cool season crops at that time. But again, the worst, seed, the worst time to direct seed into your garden would be late November, or I would just say the whole month of December, uh, November, December, and January. <clears throat> okay, I think we just said a few things about this. Transplants, like here are tomato transplants. They're always easy to plant into your containers if you buy them from, you know, buy them or grow your own transplants from seeds. Okay, so I said direct seed was most difficult during those months. Now, there are some um, <clears throat> crops that the seeds germinate really fast, some warm season crops like squash beans and cucumbers. They're very easy if you direct seed right into your outdoor pots. Beans are something I definitely would recommend direct seeding. Like these bean plants on the bottom, they germinate so fast and you can buy a packet of seeds for almost the same price that you'd buy a six pack of germinated beans. And beans don't produce all, um, they don't produce beans all summer long. You're gonna need maybe two, you could probably grow three crops of beans during the summer. I'll get to that later. But um, if you germinate them directly in your pot, it won't take very long, you should be successful. Um, squash, same thing. Squash is a big seed that germinates fast. But for things like, um, like tomatoes, cucumbers, um, I'm sorry, tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, I would use transplants because tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, they take a little longer to germinate and to grow into this size. So <clears throat> you might wanna use this size when you're, and then possibly mid or late April or the beginning of May, you can plant these directly into your containers when it's warm enough. All right, warm season versus cool season vegetables. Um, the main thing is to plant at the correct time. Um, okay, this can be a little bit confusing. We put together this vegetable planting chart, but we are in the San Francisco Bay area and we have so many microclimates. So on the right side, these are all warm season crops, warm season vegetables, right? Now, these can only be grown in late spring, summer, and early fall in our climate, no matter where you are in the Bay Area. But cool season crops like lettuces, beets, broccoli, um, bok choy, radishes, there are a lot of cool season vegetables that if you are near the coast or real close to the Bay where you get June fog and 60 degree weather and you don't get, you hardly ever get weather in the 80s, you probably could grow these cool season crops almost any time of the year. But if you're inland in a hot climate, I'm down in Morgan Hill in a hot valley in summer and cold nights in winter, and I can only grow warm season crops, um, or I can only grow cool season crops, I'm sorry, until maybe sometime in April or the end of March, because there are problems if you grow cool season crops when it's hot out, and I'll get to that later. So again, the planting chart is just a guide, and there are a lot of peas there that means it's possible because we don't know where you live. <laughs> so it depends where you live. But again, warm season crops always need warm weather, and cool season crops need cool weather, but where you live might determine if you can plant them in summer or not. All right. Okay, now, were there any questions so far that would be related to this, um, Louise? There's been lots of questions, oh, Joan. No. <laughs> Why don't you take water and relax? Um, let's see. You're going to talk more about soil, so. Yes. I will not talk about the soil ones. Let's look, let's go to some of the questions about containers. Um, let's see. Do different plants do better in ceramic versus terracotta? Does it matter which plants go in which kinds of pots? 
It, usually it doesn't matter that much. As long as you have good drainage, as long as you have good drainage and you're not getting them super saturated, and I'll talk about this with soil mix, it's more to do with water than it is the container. Okay. Do we need to add more drainage holes to um, terracotta pots that only have one hole? Do I need to drill more in them? No, oh, I, I, you know what? I was afraid this question would come up because ceramic too, there's some beautiful ceramic pots and they only have one hole on the bottom. You know, you may wanna try growing with just, if the one hole is, is big enough, um, you may not need to drill more holes. Sometimes one hole is adequate, but watch it the first year real carefully. Just watch it. If you, you know, if you repot the plant and you find out the bottom of the soil is really, really soggy, then you may want to drill some more holes. And I know about... I have some nice ceramic pots and they only have one hole. And so far I've, I've been lucky. I haven't had any um, root rot or anything in them. So just kind of watch the water, I guess. That's good. Um, what about the livestock troughs, the metal livestock troughs? Do we need to drill holes in those? Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Yes. <laughs> My neighbor growing was growing tomatoes in there, and they worked really well. But yes, they drilled a whole bunch of holes in there. Yes. OK. And let's just do one last question about, about pots. Um, do you sanitize your pots? And if so, how? Is it necessary? You know, if you're buying a new pot, we're talking about transplanting um, vegetable seedlings into larger pots. And the more established the plant is, the less, the less susceptible it will be to some of, some of the diseases that get newly germinated seed or newly, um, you know, little seedlings. Um, okay, but if you, if you, especially if you've had a problem and you're going to, put your next crop in that pot. Yeah, 10% bleach is a, probably pretty good. You know, about 10% bleach, you could sterilize your pot. But, um, you know, it depends. It, with, real, with large pots, we're talking now about transplanting seedlings into larger pots. Again, if you've had any problems, I definitely would sterilize my pot. If you haven't, you know, you might be okay because you're already putting, now I would say if you're in a real small pot, if you're um, transplanting a newly ger germinated seedling into you know, a two inch pot, those I would sterilize. When they're, when they're young plants, they're more susceptible to things, okay? Like disease, root diseases and things like that. Okay. Right. You, that's probably enough for now. Okay, all right. Um, soil mix. The first thing I want to say, it's best to get a potting soil, not a garden, not something that says garden soil, because the word garden soil, they can dig it up, sometimes a vacant lot, they'll scrape the top and sell it as garden soil. It may be real heavy. It might not have much porosity in it. It's something you throw in your garden, I guess. And I'm not sure I would even buy it for putting in my garden, because I can amend my soil and make it better than some of the stuff they put in there. But a potting soil, just buy something that says potting soil. Okay, now some potting soils will lose their characteristics faster than others. It depends how much, how many organic ingredients are in there because everything will decompose further once you have, you're growing a plant in there. And I should say the larger the container, the more leeway you might have in the type of soil mix, like how expensive your soil mix is. A real large container, um, you don't have to worry maybe quite as much as a smaller container. Okay, um, let's see. Porosity is really important with soil mix. You need to have a well-drained mix, especially in winter with lots of porosity because you might get more rain or when you do water your plants, they're gonna retain, the pot's gonna retain moisture a lot longer. Um, some of the porous ingredients include perlite. It's very porous. It's actually an expanded mineral. It doesn't hold much in the way of nutrients or add to nutrients or anything, but that's okay. Pumice can, or, or lava rock, they both have porosity to them. They won't add anything in the way of nutrients, but they will add some porosity. Okay, and these are all components that might or might not be in your soil mix. It might be a combination of three of these or all of them or even some other things that are similar. 
Rice hulls are used a lot in California now because it's a byproduct of the rice industry in the northern Central Valley of California. They have real good porosity, but they lose it fast when they start decomposing. So if you have a soil mix that's a year old in a pot, you may not recognize the rice hulls anymore. Compost is a good um, addition and a lot of potting soils have compost in them. It's actually cheap for the potting soil companies to put compost in and they most of them do. Um, but it adds beneficial microbes to your mix, which are good. And you'll get a few nutrients from compost, usually not a lot of nitrogen, but you'll get some nutrients but the microbes are really important in compost. So it's a good addition, but it will break down further. And if you grow in 100% compost, after a while, it'll get very fine because it decomposes more and it may, and it will lose any porosity that it had. It generally doesn't have too much porosity. Then core. Core is a byproduct of the coconut husk of coconut husks, all right? It's very porous and it also retains water very well but it will decompose further the older it gets. It lasts pretty long, but it'll get um, old and decompose and get, go into finer. It'll become much finer and less porous. Sphagnum peat is, um, you know, it's been used for many years in the horticulture industry and it works very well for potted plants. Um, it has porosity if you get a good quality sphagnum um, and it, it depends which quality, which quality you get is how long it will last, but all peat moss will eventually decompose. Some of the sphagnum peat will last really long, but again, it depends on the quality that they put in your potting soil. Um, bark is a really good, and peat moss doesn't add hardly anything as far as nutrients. Bark doesn't add much for nutrients, but um, it's got good porosity. It's really great in a soil mix, but bark again, over time, it decomposes more and gets very fine. So will composted forest products or forest humus, or there's wood fiber now they're using in soil mixes. Um, and all these things are, are okay, but they will break down more. So that's why your soil mix over time will get less porous. So that's one of the reasons you need to change it every so often. This is what your complete soil mix might look like. And they might not have all the, they might have some of these components. They might even have some other, um, additions, maybe some things that add some nutrients to it. Um, let's see, what else about soil mix? Okay, too many fine components in the soil mix though will make the soil or the drainage will be very poor if you have too many fine components. And again, as these organic components decompose, the soil mix is going to be finer and have less porosity. <clears throat> so you want to change it out. Um, so old used soil mix, the organic components decompose and the drainage becomes poor. And that can contribute to root disease. But I wouldn't suggest you throw out your old soil because I'd hate to see it in the landfill. You know, you could throw it in your raised bed or put it in your garden soil. I wouldn't throw it out. It still has some characteristics that might be good if you're putting it in a clay soil or something. So try to put it somewhere, not in the landfill if possible. <clears throat> okay, this is a question a lot of people ask. Do you add gravel or broken up pots on the bottom of your container? And the answer is really no, because what might happen, you might get a perched water table. A perched water table is like these diagrams here. This is just a regular potted, potted soil. There's potting soil in this container. On the bottom of the pot, you're always gonna have a a space that's pretty wet, that the roots really don't want to grow in very well. And this is the correct moisture level. So there's always like a, a water table on the bottom somewhere. Now you put something like gravel on the bottom and you're gonna raise that perched water table. And look at here, you lost a bunch of um, your potting, your best area to grow roots in. So there the roots, like to grow here, so it's a lot less than in the pot to the left. Here, another example on the bottom, the wettest soil is always on the bottom. So gravel moves the wettest part of the soil up. So that's why not to add gravel or broken up shells or something on the bottom of your container. All right, watering. Probably more plant, potted plants die from 
Overwatering or underwatering, water management is very important. Try to monitor your water carefully. Even if you're using an automatic drip, drip system or no matter what you're doing, hand watering, micro spray, whatever, you know, always, it's always a good idea to feel the soil for moisture with your fingers. Dig in there a little bit. Is it bone dry? Is it moist or is it real soggy like a sponge? Okay, so the soil, it should never be real dry. It should be moist, you know, an inch or so under, you should feel moisture, but it shouldn't feel like a sponge. It shouldn't be so soggy that it feels like a sponge. All right. Otherwise, you're going to promote root rot if it's too, um, too soggy. And when you, if you're hand watering, try to direct the nozzle toward the soil. Not trying, and I know a big tomato in a pot, you're going to get some foliage wet, but just try your best to direct more of the spray toward the the soil, because if you water the foliage all the time, you're gonna encourage pests like aphids, lots of diseases like bacterial and fungal diseases. So try your best to hit the soil, not so much foliage when you're watering. Okay, there is a point of no return. <laughs> okay, it's called the permanent wilting point where plants wilt permanently and they won't come back. So remember, containers can dry out fast, especially in summer. Um, now this pepper plant that's wilting in a container, um, if it, this were at my house, I would water it really well and make sure that root ball is very moist. Make sure the whole root system gets very moist. This might pop back. It might not quite be to the permanent wilting point. So if you have one like this, try to water it really well, but if it doesn't pop back, then you know, you reach the per permanent wilting point. It's the percentage of uh, soil moisture that's, it's, it's, your plant's gonna die. <laughs> okay, it's gonna wilt permanently. <clears throat> All right, anything on soil mix before I get to fertilizer? For fertilizer and soil mix almost kind of goes together. Anything on soil mix? Let's see, yes, lots and lots and lots of questions. <laughs> um, I think that the question that seems to be the most predominant is about reusing soil from pots. Oh, okay. Okay. The reason why reusing soil isn't always so good is because it loses porosity. Like I was saying, think, um, a lot of components decompose further in the pot. And you, if you've had any root diseases, they could be in the soil. So that's why um, reusing soil. Now, I would say if you're in a big pot in the backyard um, and you're going from broccoli to tomatoes or something like that, and you just put brand new soil in your broccoli pot, and now you're done with broccoli, and maybe in <clears throat> mid-April or the end of April, you're going to plant your tomatoes. If the soil still looks like it has good characteristics, if it feels, if it doesn't feel real fine, if there's still some coarse components in it, you might reuse it once. I do that, especially between like tomatoes and broccoli, between maybe a winter and summer crop, or um, to make, you know, peppers maybe and some uh, lettuce, greens or something like that. But I wouldn't reuse it more than once. I, I wouldn't do that. So, so can you make sure that we're clear when you say reuse, you mean you would grow two crops in one pot, at, in one pot of soil at most before changing the soil out. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And again, look at the soil. Sometimes I have, I buy some baled soil mix sometimes. It's got really, really good components and it's what growers use. <laughs> so anyway, it's, and it's expensive, but it lasts, it doesn't decompose so fast. So I, I always reuse that at least once. But then I look at it and it still looks like, like it's new. You can kind of tell if your soil is starting to decompose. It gets finer. It gets more kind of mushy when it gets wet. That I would throw up. I would not throw it away. Put it in your garden, some, your outdoor garden somewhere, or put it under a tree or something. But I wouldn't reuse that. So look at the soil and make a judgment. If, it's, if it was a really good quality soil and it still looks like it has a lot of coarse components in it. Mm -hmm. that add porosity then and you didn't have a disease and you had no diseases 
then I would I would reuse it. But otherwise, um, you know, I would not. So what, you have to cut. About, what judge. about mixing stuff back into your old potted soil, potting soil? Can you add stuff back into it to make it better, like adding compost or fertilizer, or is that a waste? Of okay, we'll get to fertilizers is not a component of soil mix, but we'll get to that in a minute. But um, yeah, maybe adding some more like pumice or lava rock sometimes, something more porous in there, um, or sometimes adding some, some new soil mix in there might, you know, if you're going to use the same pot and you're kind of, you're taking out um, your broccoli and you're going to put your tomatoes in, kind of mix, mix it up and add some new soil. Again, if the soil mix, if you used a new bag of soil the last time you grew something and it doesn't look like it's decomposed too much, if it still looks like pretty good soil, it's not mushy or real fine, uh, yeah, you could add, add some more soil mix to it or add something kind of coarse to it. Maybe some more bark or perlite or pumice or lava rock or something, or all the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, what should one use to fill a livestock trough? Um, soil mix <laughs> or potting soil. Yeah, you could use potting soil for that. Um, yeah, that's a that's a big a big area. That's almost like a raised bed. But, I would say yeah, you could, you yeah, can, and you can and you can add compost to it too. You can add put some potting soil and compost in, and um, yeah. Okay, okay. Should I go into fertilizer? Sure, that'd be great. All right, okay. Fertilizing, okay. It, very important in potted crops because when you're growing in the soil, you're getting a lot of nutrients in the so from the soil, but when you're in a pot. Like I talked about the components that are usually used in a soil mix, they have very little um, nutrients in it, very small amount of nutrients, if anything, in it. Now, some potting soils say they have nutrients. They might have bat guano or blood meal or some other things in it, um, or they say they added fertilizer. But a, a potting soil company can't add enough fertilizer for you to grow in it more than maybe a few a month or a few weeks. The reason is if they put enough fertilizer in there to carry the whole crop several months, um, you would have a solves problem. You can't put enough fertilizer in the bag of potting soil that will carry it so long that you're not gonna have a salt problem in the beginning. You can't put too much in. So normally potting soil companies, they put in a little bit of starter nutrients and maybe they'll last a few weeks, maybe a month. So what I would suggest is, um, if it said there's fertilizer in the bag, you know, wait a few weeks and maybe fertilize after a few weeks, but go with a low rate, the lowest rate on the package if you're not sure how long the fertilizer in the potting soil is going to last. Okay, but for um, what your plants need, your all the vegetables we're talking about tonight need primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's N, P, K, and that will be on the fertilizer package. And the first thing on the fertilizer package will be N, nitrogen, and then P and K. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so your plants, for all the plants we're talking about tonight, vegetables, they're gonna use more nitrogen than anything else. So it would be nice to have a fertilizer with more nitrogen than anything else in it. Okay, secondary nutrients are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Now, unless you're on 100% hetch hetchy water, which is really snow melt water, which has nothing in it. Um, all our groundwater in Santa Clara County has calcium, magnesium, and pretty good levels too. I used to um, take a lot of water samples around and there's a lot of calcium, magnesium in most of our water and sulfur. And think about water. You're watering your plants a lot. So you're adding some nutrients when you water. And I think some of the Hetch Hetchy water is also mixed with groundwater. Also in potting soils, they usually put some lime or gypsum or something in where you're gonna get a little extra calcium and magnesium. Now, if your fertilizer bag has some calcium or magnesium in it, it's fine, but I wouldn't worry too much about those because again, your water might provide some secondary nutrients. Now, there are minor elements that are very important to your vegetables too, because in the containers, you're not gonna get this. So iron, zinc, copper, and manganese um, are very important. <clears throat> Molybdenum and boron are also important, but I'm not so worried about those for what we're talking about tonight. 
here I want you to see this picture on the left. Somebody germinated their own seedlings in a pot and um, <clears throat> they're very nitrogen deficient. They didn't add any nitrogen because they thought the potting soil had it in, but it really didn't. So nitrogen deficiency. On the right, broccoli, minor element deficiencies like iron, zinc, copper, and manganese. So you can get deficiencies easy in potted plants. Okay, here's some fertilizer examples. Now the fertilizer um, is required by law to have the three numbers, how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium you have in there. And it has to have a guaranteed uh, analysis on the label, on the fertilizer package. And it has to be approved by the state of California Department of Food and Agriculture. Now these are two different fertilizers here. Here's a 1055. Okay, this, this has more nitrogen than the other elements. So if this has trace elements in it, it would probably be fine, good for vegetables. This fertilizer here is a different one. It's an 848 plus minor elements. So you see the minor elements are in there, 848. Um, that would be fine for what we're talking about tonight for container two. Okay, but the, again, the ideal fertilizer would have more nitrogen than other elements and a complete fertilizer is needed. Something that has minor elements in it and nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, let's see what else here. Yeah, it must be, fertilizer has to, nutrients have to be in a liquid state to be absorbed by the root system of the plant. So I'm not recommending any fertilizers here. There are lots of good fertilizer and lots of different types of fertilizers too. Some are water soluble or liquid or granular or slow release granular or slow release encapsulated. But if you're getting granular or slow release fertilizers that you're putting on the top of the soil of your potted plants, and this is very important, when you water, you've got to water that fertilizer so the nutrients go into the root system. Every time you water, you should be watering that fertilizer that you scattered on the top of the plant because the nutrients have to go into that, you know, have to be carried by the water into the root system, into the where the roots are. And um, so, <clears throat> so that's important. So a water soluble, you just mix with water and apply it with a sprinkling can or whatever. Same with a liquid, it might say a tablespoon or two tablespoons per gallon. You mix it up and you just water it in. Okay, so read, um, oh, too much or too little fertilizer will affect the health of the plant and the yield. Too little fertilizer, if you get deficiencies, you're not gonna get the yield, you're not gonna get very healthy plants, but too much fertilizer is just as bad because sometimes too much nitrogen can attract pests like aphids. They love lush green growth. And if you add too much nitrogen, you may not um, have flowers and get uh, tomatoes because the plant's gonna put on too much lush growth. So what you wanna do is read the fertilizer package all right, or the fertilizer label package, whatever. And they will have directions on how much to use. Now you might say, oh, a 20, well, this one is a 20, 20, 20, and something else might be an 888. Um, you might say, wait, now, now what, what should I use? 8% versus 20%? You don't have to worry about that because on the fertilizer package, they've um, they've calculated the rates that you need to use. So a 20-20-20, you're not going to use as much fertilizer as an 8-8-8, because 8% is a lot less than 20%. So they have cal calculated that out. So you don't need to worry about that. And if it is an 8-8-8 or a 20-20-20, you know, ideally, it would be nice to have more nitrogen than anything else. But you could, you know, you could use a 20-20-20 or an 8882. 8 2 <laughs> All right, read the fertilizer label or the directions for the rates and the reapplication times. This is important because reapplication time is gonna tell you when the fertilizer, when the nutrients are pretty well depleted. If it says reapply in two weeks, like some of the liquid and water soluble fertilizers say, that means it's depleted in two weeks. So that gives you an idea of when to reapply. Now, at the end of the season, you don't need to fertilize anymore. You know, when your tomatoes are all productive and it's mid-September, you know, don't worry about 
putting more fertilizer on. Same with peppers or any of your other crops. Once they get um, to the point where you don't have too many weeks left until you're gonna eat the crop, like lettuce and things like that, I wouldn't worry about uh, reapplying fertilizer at that point. All right, any um, questions? Let's see, I think I'm fertilizer. Any questions on that? Yes, um, but you have answered some of them as you've gone along. Let me just look here. Um, fertilizer. Oh, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit to some of the questions about soil. Okay. If you're not going to put gravel in the pot, <laughs> what should you put on top of the hole so the soil doesn't fall out? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, you, there are some material, you know, sometimes some materials, maybe some, um, oh, geez, you know what, because we had some palm trees cut down sometimes that palm, palm stuff, that stringy stuff I put on the bottom, you know, be creative, you could put some real coarse uh, or material with holes in on the bottom, just don't put something that's going to block the water from going there. Um, put kind of a coarse material that covers that bottom hole, but not that's not anything that's going to block the hole. Something coarse, maybe um, wicker or something like that. Some um, something like that. Okay. Yeah, in my experience, the soil doesn't fall out. Even if you, I never put anything over the hole, and the soil doesn't fall out. But yeah, I don't put too much. Like yeah. I said, I have some of that stringy palm. Um, from palm fronds. And I, I maybe I put a little bit of that, but I don't put very much. I don't cover the whole hole. <clears throat> how, how full should you fill the container when you're putting the soil in? How full? Well, if it's a big, it depends how big it is, but um, not quite to the top, you know, maybe a few inches, if it's a big container, a few inches from the top, but you don't want the plant so far in there that it's gonna be shaded either. You know, at least a few inches, you know, leave a few inches of the rim showing, mm -hmm. usually. Okay, on fertilizer, we've already had a couple of questions about using Epsom salt as a magnesium supplement. What do you say? Oh, about that? okay. Good question, because all the information from the East Coast, they always say put Epsom salts, magnesium sulfate in. And even a lot of the growers out here didn't do that because most of our water around here has quite a bit may of magnesium in it. Most of our groundwater in Santa Clara County, now it might be different up in the foothills of the Sierra or the Sierras. I know it um, sent in water samples and their water is more pure where maybe Epsom salts would be good. But down here, no, I, I don't think I would use Epsom salts because there's a danger. If you put too much magnesium in, you can tie up the calcium. The calcium will be less available. So it's the ratio of different elements too, that's real important. Also too much magnesium can tie up potassium. So you don't wanna to put too much of anything. That's why sometimes just buying a balanced fertilizer is a good idea. Because once you start fiddling out with your, your own formulations, you might get too much of something <laughs> that will tie up. We have all kinds of charts that show what will tie up uh, something else. And also it depends how alkaline and acidic your soil is. So. I don't think I would add more magnesium in this area. Um, here's a question. Is chemical fertilizer okay to use for vegetables? Um, yeah, it's your choice. You know, it's your choice what you want to use. Yes, um, it's not dangerous or anything. It doesn't have toxic stuff in it. It's not like a pesticide. Right. Okay. Okay, that's probably enough for now. Okay, we'll go into... The next slide. Okay, now I'm gonna try to kind of quickly go through some of these, you know, vegetables for containers. Here's some cool season root vegetables that can be used in containers. It's just that if you grow carrots or parsnips, you want a much deeper container, unless you're growing those real small carrots. <laughs> and you might have misshapen roots if you plant too close together. So if you've had this problem, um, sometimes if the soil is too compact or it's not porous enough, this could happen too, but usually it's because you're crowding your plants too much. All right, next slide. Um, 
Okay, it's best with these root cool season root vegetables not to wait too long to harvest. If, they're, if they look like they're the size that are ready to pick, you might wanna just harvest them because if you wait too long, they could become woody and kind of fibrous. Um, parsnips take a really long time. They're one of the, probably the more difficult ones to grow. Um, radishes are the quickest. Radishes and turnips are really easy and quick to grow and don't take up much. Radishes hardly take up any space either. <clears throat> and beets are kind of in the middle, but they're easy to grow in containers. And just because you see the beets, that's fine. That's the way they grow. You don't have to cover them up with soil. Um, okay, broccoli, cauliflower, Romanesco cauliflower. Um, you want big pots for these, very large containers. I like growing broccoli out of all of these because broccoli, like the, contain the picture on the, the bottom right side, you can see where I picked off the head and then you get all this sprouting broccoli on the side. So broccoli continues to produce for many months where Romanesco cauliflower or cauliflower, it's pretty much a one shot deal. Once you harvest the head, it's hard to get har uh, side shoots where broccoli, you harvest the head and you get lots of side shoots. So they grow very well. This is at my house in a container, even with my, my heavy frost area. <laughs> Okay, pests, um, broccoli and cauliflower. They do have some pests, cabbage worm, cabbage looper, eats holes in leaves. If it's a big problem, there is a natural BT product. It's a Bacillus thuringiensis and it will control um, the problem. It's very specific. So don't worry about the monarch butterflies if there are any more because you would only spray the cabbage or broccoli or Romanesco leaves with it. You're not gonna spray anything else with this product. And what it does, it prevents the caterpillar from eating more. So the caterpillar dies of hunger and monarchs don't lay their eggs on cabbage related plants. Okay, cool season container vegetables that don't need deep containers are some of these. Like I've mentioned a few times before, arugula and mustard, um, Mustard greens are really easy to grow. Spinach is pretty easy, lettuce too. So, whoops. <clears throat> Don't need deep containers. Be creative with your containers. If there's something laying around the house that you're gonna throw out, can it be used for a container? So recycle or, or reuse if you can, I guess. Um, okay, bok choy, Chinese cabbage and chard. You might wanna use something a little bigger than you'd use for lettuce if you're gonna let them grow full size. So something a little deeper, but you don't need real big pots for these. Okay, this is at my house. I have, oh, birds love these uh, cool season vegetables. So I, I use the stiff plastic screening. I hate the flimsy stuff, but screening over some of my bok choy and stuff like that, because the birds love those vegetables. <clears throat> okay, these are um, some cool season vegetables that are very frost tolerant. They can survive deep freezes, arugula, kale, and spinach, and they're all very easy to grow. Okay, some greens are sensitive to heat. Um, okay, when we start getting hot spells, like maybe in March, maybe even in February, March or April, you might start see, seeing this happen where um, your the spinach, or the lettuce, it wants to produce a flower and a seed. So it's gonna start to bolt. Okay, once it starts doing this, it's gonna taste bad. They're gonna start getting bitter and fibrous. So if you get a hot spell, that's why you have to be, if you're in a hot inland summer climate, you have to kind of time your cool season vegetables carefully because in that month of March, April, or May, we could get hot spells. And if you still have a lot of cool season vegetables out there, they could start bolting. Like if you're in the South County area or even parts of San Jose that get really hot, if you're near the Bay, you might not have to worry about this so much. Okay, here are some other um, vegetables that are very sensitive to heat that start bolting really quick. Bok or pak choy is one that will bolt very early in heat. Um, it starts producing a flower and these flower buds, um, this is it cut open. You can see the flower bud is being produced. At this stage, you could still eat 
eat the plant, but anything past this, it's gonna get really bitter and it won't taste good, fibrous and bitter. Here's some bok choy growing in um, cool weather. It's nice and succulent and really tasty. And by the way, some vegetables taste better after a frost, some of the cool season vegetables. And the reason for that, I better tell you the reason, because um, after a frost, you know, they start producing sugar like anti antifreeze and spinach. If you eat spinach after a frost, it's really good because it produces more um, sugar to act as an antifreeze. Okay, chard and spinach, they're a lot more susceptible to leaf miners when grown in hot weather. And leaf miners are this, the larvae gets into the leaf of spinach or whatever you're growing where, when it starts getting hot out and it makes kind of, it eats out, it eats in the inside of the leaf and kind of makes circles. This is what the adult looks like, but the larvae is inside the leaf. So there's not, not much you can do except pick off the, you know, the bad leaves. But um, leaf miners, you'll have a lot more of them in hot weather. If you grow your cool season crops in hot weather, that's when it's really a problem. In cool weather, leaf miners don't like cold weather so much. Here's another cool season vegetable, good in a medium sized container, maybe a little larger. Um, but protect young plants from birds because peas, the birds will eat them up. Um, peas get starchy if you wait too long to harvest. Also, if you grow them in hot weather, they won't taste so good. So again, protection from birds is real important. You might have to make a cage or put row cover or something over the top of them for a while until they get larger. Okay, here's onion, shallots, garlic, garlic leeks, and scallions. Okay, um, these are all very frost tolerant, can be grown in midwinter. And there's a lot more about growing onions and all these crops on our website. So go to our website if you want more information. But they usually do well in um, medium size or somewhat shallow containers. Um, there's one, leeks, I might use something a little bit larger to grow leeks in, but scallions can grow in a real shallow container. And again, you can harvest greens anytime. Your salad greens, you can, um, if you're planting a bunch of them in a pot, you're seeding them in a pot and you wanna thin them out, eat them. You know, they sell baby greens in the stores. They're real tender and good. Okay, a few pests that you might come up uh, upon, especially in winter or um, during the cool season are aphids. Although in summer you can get them on your peppers and tomatoes also, if we have a cool spell for a week or something, watch for aphids because they'll come out. Now there are a lot of natural pests for aphids. These are some different types of wasps that lay eggs inside the aphid body and then they hatch and they eat the inside of the aphid out and you have this like mummified aphid body here laying around. <laughs> okay, so they will go after aphids. Now ants will protect aphids. They like aphids not to eat them, but they like the honeydew they produce. So they protect them and sometimes the ants will fight off the beneficial insects. So um, a little bit about pest control. The best thing you can do for aphids is wash them off with a heavy stream of water. Even if you have water in a spray bottle, it might help. Aphids are not strong insects. They don't often crawl back to the same plant because usually something gets them before that and they're not real fast. Um, the other thing, control the ants with baits. Um, insecticidal soap, I should have put that on a different line, but um, ants, if you can control the ants, sometimes the beneficial insects will take care of the aphids, but the ants will protect the aphids. Insecticidal soap will um, kill aphids, but it also kills your beneficial insects. And I'm not sure I wanna use insecticidal soap on my Green, salad greens. So the best thing, just try to, um, also the way you water things, try not to keep things real, real wet all the time because aphids, you'll get more infestations in that area. But aphids have a lot of enemies. Here's lady beetles, but the lady beetle larvae, if you ever see this guy in your garden, don't kill it because they eat more aphids than when they grow into lady beetles, they still eat aphids, but less of them. So the larvae of the lady beetle eats lots of aphids. You might have some slugs and snails in winter. 
um, in your on your potted plants. Sometimes this um, copper tape around your potted plants might work, but you have to keep it clean or the snails will crawl right over it. There's a product called Sluggo. I think now there's a lot of products like it that have iron phosphate bait. So iron phosphate will become a fertilizer, but what happens is a snail, they'll eat, they'll be attracted by the bait and eat this and dehydrate and die. So iron phosphate is not a toxic substance and it won't harm people or anybody. So anyway, it will turn into fertilizer. <clears throat> okay, critters, birds and squirrels can be bad, especially I know I have problems with birds, so I have to cover everything, either with row cover or make cages or whatever, because cool season vegetables, especially the, the greens, they love them. <laughs> okay, we'll say a few words. I think we have a little time left on the warm season crops for containers. Now, when you're planting your transplants into containers for these crops, we always suggest that you should plant after you consistently have 50 degrees or higher for night temperatures, night temperatures, because um, all these vegetables, they do not do well if your temperatures are in the 40s or 30s, they're gonna sit there. And I know some of the stores will, um, they sell tomato transplants in February. You're not gonna get a head start in February if you plant tomatoes outside. They're gonna sit there and they may get bacterial or fungal diseases and they're gonna sit there and not grow and just more susceptible to diseases. So you really shouldn't plant them at that time. And we usually suggest sometime maybe mid April or end of April or early May would be the best time to plant most of these warm season vegetables that I'm showing right now. Um, but look at the weather too. If there's a big rainstorm coming, hold off, plant after the rainstorm because Rain, you know, water on the foliage, just um, it's better to wait. Watch the weather and then see what happens. <laughs> the biggest um, selling vegetable plant for summer is tomato plants, tomato transplants. There are a lot of compact varieties. The horticulture business knows that homes are, uh, patio, I'm sorry, yards are getting much smaller. There are more condos and those things. So there's definitely been a big effort at breeding tomato varieties that will grow well in containers. There are lots of them now. <clears throat> Usually a determinate compact tomato variety would be the best. However, cherry tomatoes, uh, it doesn't matter because they don't get so big and heavy. And you can prune cherry tomatoes so easily. These are, the two left pictures are in my yard in Morgan Hill. Um, that's some kind of a bush, bush steak or one of the bush tomatoes, <clears throat> compact varieties grow very well in a container. I still put some steaks, maybe the flimsy steaks, or you could put um, e yeah, either steaks or cages in them or something to kind of hold them up a little bit. This patio choice yellow, I've been growing this a few years. Um, this is really, really early, an early ver cherry variety, and it only grows about eight inch, 18 inches tall. So you really don't need to stake it. And it's the earliest variety, kind of gets um, ripe even in June. Like um, I grow some things in palm, uh, we were talking about containers, in palm stumps. We had some palm trees cut down at our house and they decompose from the inside. The inside decomposes first and I put plants in there and the root systems go nuts. They just love the palm containers. Although I really have to fertilize them because I think, um, yeah, well, anyway, this is um, one of those um, patio choice tomatoes, and I think this is in May, the end of May or beginning of June. I'm already starting to get a few ripen. <clears throat> that was last year. And then I grow some cherry tomatoes in pots. And again, if you don't like all this sprawling stuff, prune it out. You can prune cherry tomatoes whenever you want. <laughs> and this is a compact tomato in a pot. Lots of compact varieties now. A lot of good, good varieties out there now in tomatoes. You don't have to get the tomatoes that are five feet tall and four feet wide anymore because the, some of these new varieties really produce good, uh, good crops and somewhat disease resistant. Peppers and eggplants have very similar requirements as tomatoes. They love warm weather. They can survive hot weather. Um, there are some compact varieties of eggplants now and peppers and 
all kinds of things. Read the plant tag because that will give you an idea how large your plant should be. If it's gonna be a real large plant, like if they say three and a half feet tall, then you want a larger pot. But a lot of these new varieties are much smaller. <clears throat> um, cucurbits, make sure the weather and soil is warm enough for cucurbits. Cucumbers are something I usually plant last. I think cucumbers maybe are a little fussier about warm weather than some of the other, cucumbers and melons more than like squash. <clears throat> so I plant the cucumbers last. Sometimes it's nice to have a trellis if you're growing cucumbers in a pot, but there are some bush varieties of cucumbers too. There are some zucchinis that are really nice um, compact varieties. There's one called Astia. And a lot of the seed companies have this <clears throat> Astia seed. A lot of us master gardeners are growing it now. It's real easy to pick and the, the zucchinis don't sprawl all over the place. So much easier than growing zucchinis on the, on the garden soil or in the garden soil. Pumpkins here, um, there's some butternut squash that are compact varieties now. You still might have a little trellis or steak or something in there. Okay, um, beans. You can um, easily plant containers with bean seeds. Oh, and by the way, squash too. I, I direct seed my squash because squash is real easy. Uh, it germinates really fast and really easy. You know, if the soil is warm enough, <clears throat> beans really germinate fast and they're very easy to grow. It's a fast crop. Um, so you can plant your container, you know, with seeds if it's warm enough and you'll, you'll get a crop fast. Um, okay, if you're, if you're getting pole beans, make sure you read what variety you're getting if you're buying a seed packet. Because <clears throat> the pole beans, you want a stake or a pole or something to grow them on. Like the beans on the left, the beans on the right. The two in the middle are a variety called mascotti. This is probably one of the most compact bean plants that I've ever seen. And this variety called Muscati, a lot of seed companies have it now. It's really productive. It won an um, All-American Selection Award a few years ago. It's outstanding. I mean, I just can't believe it. You can grow it in really small containers too. And one plant produces lots of beans. <clears throat> but one thing about beans, um, beans aren't gonna produce, bean plants aren't gonna produce beans all summer long. You have to realize they kind of have a life a lifespan. After you're, after you're picking beans for about three weeks or so, plus or minus a little bit, your plant might start not getting so productive anymore. You're gonna get less flowers, less beans. The beans you get might be smaller and curly or something. That's the time, yank them out and plant another crop. You can easily plant maybe two, two or maybe three crops um, in our climate of beans if you're in a warm, warm climate in the Bay Area. So again, beans aren't gonna produce all summer long off of the same plant. You might wanna pull them out after you get a good crop for a few weeks and your next crop will be in no time. They grow really fast. <clears throat> so anyway, I think that's about it. So we as master gardeners, we really want you to be successful and have a really good harvest. And if you have more questions, we do have, um, we have a handout with reference on, and our website has a lot of reference, resource references and links to other information. <clears throat> and we have a helpline that you can contact us from our website too. So we just wish you the best of luck and hope you have a really good harvest with whatever you are growing. Okay, and I can, guess I can take some more questions now. Well, we have lots of questions, Joan. This has been fabulous. Um, while we're on the subject of beans, since you just finished, we've had a couple questions about fertilizing beans. Some people have heard that you don't want to fertilize beans with a nitrogen fertilizer. Is that true? Okay, um, that's usually true if you're in a garden soil, if you're in your own soil. But if you're in a container, okay, that's, that's one you don't have to fertilize very much. If you're in a container, you still might want to use some light rates of fertilizer a few times, but you don't have to use very much because beans have um, nitrogen fixing bacteria on their roots. They're a nitrogen fixer. So that is an exception that I know there's so much to cover. You can do weeks and weeks of classes and all that, but um, beans, 
in a container, I would still use a little bit of fertilizer because again, the soil mix isn't gonna provide very much and they're gonna fix a lot of their own nitrogen, but use small rates, the smallest rate on the package. Just use a little bit, you know, it probably would be helpful because beans can get deficient and I've seen them get deficient if you have nothing there. Even the hydroponic growers, they have to fertilize them. You can't grow with no nutrients. You know, the cotyledon of the seed, it's not gonna have enough to carry it the whole crop. Okay, next. Um, a couple of questions about vegetarian types of fertilizer. Can you recommend oh. any particular <clears throat> vegetarian fertilizers? Well, I guess vegetarian would be, they don't come from animals. So you probably wouldn't use manures or, or things like that. Um, but manures and blood meal and that, they're byproducts. If you're into sustainability, they are byproducts of the meat industry. But if you're against meat or you don't, you want something purely vegetarian. Well, the, um, the synthetic fertilizers don't come from meat. And um, some of the cotton seed oils and things like that, um, but they don't always have a lot of nitrogen in them. You look at the nitrogen, look at, I haven't looked at cottonseed oil for a while. See how much nitrogen in it, because that would be one that comes from, it's a byproduct of the cotton industry, comes from cotton seeds, and that might um, have some nutrients. I don't know how much, I forgot how much nitrogen is in that one. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, I never had that question before. <laughs> we've, we've gotten that a couple times, so that's something okay. we should keep in mind for future. Okay. Sure, I don't know worms, what about worm? But are worms considered, what about insects? Or Well, worms aren't even insects, so I don't know about earthworms because they have um, earthworm castings, right? I, I think so I that know. would be okay, I, but I'm actually not sure. Okay. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, a question about um, the seeds. Do you have any particular recommendations for where people can find these interesting varieties? Oh, okay. We can't make, we don't make um, brand name or company recommendations at Master Gardeners because we're, we're part of university system, but I can say there's lots of good seed catalogs. Just go online and Google if you're interested in like Mescotti bean seeds or um, Astia squash or seeds. Um, there's lots of companies that, that are seed companies that have catalogs I mean, I guess I could mention, I'm not going to endorse any of these, but there's Johnny's and Burpee's and Park Seed and Territorial Seed and Harris Seed, and I could go on and on and on, and I'm not recommending any of them, but, um, but there's lots of them to pick from. There's lots of seed companies to pick from that you can order and get seed packets pretty quickly. One of the things I noticed this year, though, wow, a lot of seed companies are short on stock this year, because I order a lot of seeds every single year, and this year... A lot of things I clicked on, out of stock, out of stock. So if you're going to order seeds, you might want to think about ordering them pretty soon. But there's lots of seed catalogs. I think I'd rather buy them from a seed, um, a seed house or like a seed catalog than Amazon. I just think it, and it's only my personal view. I like to support the industry rather than, you know, just someone who ships everything around. Although they probably get them from, they get them from seed companies too. So anyway. Whatever. I can guarantee you that Amazon does not grow its own seeds. Well, right, right. But then you um, don't know where they're getting them. Well, whatever. Let's see. Oh, another question. Um, oh, go ahead. A couple of times someone has asked, if you grow a large, like an indeterminate tomato in, say, a five-gallon container, um, would that work? Will it just produce less fruit than it otherwise would, or is it just not going to do well? Yeah, there are some issues. It's going to dry out really fast. It will probably produce less fruit than you would have that unless you had that in a um, a, lot, a really giant container or in your garden soil. Um, yeah, it's just more difficult, much more difficult to grow, and you're not going to probably get the yield out of it. And I think this probably should be our last question. There's, I, I wanna apologize that we are not able to get to all the questions. There have been lots and lots of them. Um, this last one I think is a pretty important one though and I don't have an answer myself. What should patio gardeners do with old soil? 
You know, I was thinking about that when I was um, doing this pres presentation or putting it together. Um, boy, I know, I, I hate seeing things go to the landfill. Boy, if you could um, put it under a tree or something, I don't know, I, I really don't have an answer to that. You know, if there was someone who, who you know who has a yard who would take it and dump it in their yard somewhere, you know, because it's gonna just become regular soil, you know, even though it might not be good for your pots anymore. I but it's, you know, yeah. It can, it can go on soil anywhere, just almost like a mulch. Yeah, right? it, it's, sure, it's sure. Stuff. Maybe even take it to a local community garden and ask them if you want to, if they can add it to their compost pile. <laughs> oh, good idea. I love that idea. Sure. Yeah, you could put it in. You know, I wonder, well, do they have green waste at apartment complexes? Because I wonder if putting it in the green waste, at least then you know it's going to go to a compost site and it will be used again. Yeah, good idea. So. Well, I think we should probably wrap it up. 